Welcome to Evolution Fast Forward podcast series on the synthesis of yoga by Sri Aurobindo. This is the second episode in the series. The first one we started with the introduction, the first chapter, the first paragraph, where Sri Aurobindo touched upon two necessities of nature that intervene into our human activities. These two necessities where one is, there's a movement from simple harmony to more and more complex and complete harmony. In that movement, there is, there is a necessity of diversification and unification, diversity and unity, two movements within nature and moving from simple to complex harmony. The second necessity is rebirth. Anything that is well formed will fossilize and harden and it has to be broken so that the fresh streams of the spirit can enter and rejuvenate it. So there is a process of rebirth. Anything that is cast into forms will go through the process of eventually fossilizing and then it has to be broken down and then there is a rebirth. So there is an evolutionary process from simple to more and more complex harmonies in which there is diversity, unity, diversity, unity. From there, Sri Aurobindo comes to that, uh, the image of the cauldron of Medea, the Greek image, where the world is really seen like a melting pot where everything is brought in and melted, shredded, and given a chance for rebirth for rejuvenation. And he sees yoga, Indian yoga, as one of the dynamic elements that will be necessary for the future of humanity. And it is going to play a role. And But for that, third point he brings is yoga has to rediscover its essence and its purpose and rejuvenate. So reorient, re calibrate and deal with the new challenges of humanity. So that's the first paragraph, the overview of it. And uh, now he takes up the next paragraph we will be starting now, what yoga is. So let's see what he has to say. In the right view, both of life and of yoga, All life is either consciously or subconsciously a yoga. Now that's a profound statement, very radical statement in fact. First of all, all life. Is it life of we, the individuals, life of all humanity? Because Our normal perception about yoga is it is something that we humans do and that too, it's a specific set of practices that we do. Then there is general life where we deal with the mundane activities of life. Then there is a yoga practice. Whatsoever be the meaning of the word yoga that you give to it, there is a separation between what you do as yoga and life in general. He's saying all life is yoga. So is it our individuals and human life or does it include life of animals, trees, life of earth or life, what does it encompass? He's saying all life is either consciously or unconscious, subconsciously a yoga. So there's a vast movement he is looking at. Let's get into the details of it. For we mean by this term a methodized effort towards self-perfection. It's a methodized effort towards self-perfection. What is self-perfection? There is an aspiration in humanity everywhere. You know, we are trying to perfect ourselves. Let's explore what is self-perfection means here in this context and how it comes about. 
a methodized effort towards self perfection by the expression of the secret potentialities latent in the being there are potentialities latent in the being which become an expression there is a being and becoming potentialities in the being that finds expression secret potentialities it is this potentialities emerging and manifesting that leads towards self perfection there are already existing expressed possibilities or expressed capacities in life and there are latent possibilities just like in a seed a tree is latent it is only when a seed sprouts in time and space the mighty tree unfolds that is expression of what was latent in the seed so at the seed state it is latent when it grows and manifests as a tree then it is a, a manifest expression so by the expression of a, of the secret potentialities latent in the being it is through the, with, by that we reach self perfection and highest condition of victory in that effort so there is an effort required yoga is a systematic methodized effort and he is saying there is a condition this effort to reach its victory the highest condition is a union of the human individual with the universal and transcendent existence this is a condition if this effort of yoga is to reach its victory of self perfection it has to fulfill this condition of the union of the individual with universal and transcendent now here there are two critical words what is universal what is transcendent how do we understand these terms individual that is clear we are individuals now imagine we are to break out of our individuality this mold is gently becoming open for us and we melt into something larger we are melting into a universal existence let's say like a drop of water merging back into the ocean say that whole ocean is the universal now what does that ocean means is it really we the human individual spreading and merging with the 9 billion other individuals only humanity or are we merging into all other life forms entire ecosystem life of earth is that universal or does it expand beyond the earth to entire solar system into the entire galaxy or other galaxies or does it also include other dimensions because what we see is the material dimension is this universal include the entire other dimensions so just hold that question it's not really so much about having a definition a fixed answer but to have really a living question share when those words are very potent with meanings and this meaning will evolve richly as you go deeper and deeper the word universal is a very important word whatsoever be the meaning that you are holding at this point of time just to reflect on it and see what is the meaning that you are currently holding individually is clear now when we expand and go beyond the individual there is universal but it doesn't end there he is saying transcendent existence that's another important term what is it that transcend the whole ocean of existence let's say the formless that which is beyond time and space out of that whole manifestation arises the entire manifestation if we consider it as the universal within that universal there is the individual an individual is unfolding in time and space the whole universal manifestation is unfolding in time and space 
and then that which is beyond the source from where both came, beyond time and space. So let's say if you take gravity, Earth as a planet has its own individual gravity, which is different from Moon's gravity, Sun's gravitational force, other planets. Every planet has its own individual gravitational power, force. And there is at the same time a universal principle of gravitation, which is applicable across. There's a universal principle, there is an individual gravity that is a result of it. Then that which is beyond time and space, before all the planets and the entire material manifest visible creation came into existence, where was it? Before time, before space, that is transcendent. So laws of physics, Newtonian physics is applicable at universal level, planetary, material, physical level. But there is that which is beyond Newtonian physics when it is beyond time and space. There is individual, universal, transcendent. So in yoga too, there is individual, universal, transcendent. And just keep that in mind as a framework. This is an important framework in Sri Aurobindo's teachings. So a union of the individual with with the universal and transcendent existence, we see partially expressed in man and in the cosmos. So that union is only partially expressed. Our existence is really not, uh, it is interconnected and woven into everything else, but the possibilities are only partially expressed. The union of the human individual with the universal and transcendent existence, existence is a condition for victory, victory of which effort, the effort of yoga for self-perfection. It's a very important statement here. It is not just our little individual will and its effort. This has to merge into the universal and uni unify with the transcendent. And that's the highest condition for the victory. But all life, when look when we look behind its appearances, how do we look behind appearances? There is what appears as a material outer crust. And we need to look beyond that material outer crust through subtle vision. And that is, again, what the powers, the yogic process brings to see beyond the surface appearances. But all life, when we look, <coughs> but all life, when we look behind its appearances, is a vast yoga of nature. So he is bringing here, it, he is talking about the vast yoga of nature, who attempts in the conscious and the subconscious. It is nature who is attempting in the conscious and the subconscious to realize her perfection. He is referring to nature as she. Now, this is very important again for yogic approach. We are looking at whole nature as conscious being. It's not mechanical machinery. It's not just material machinery, living being. Her perfection, to realize her perfection, who attempts in the conscious and the subconscious to realize her perfection in an ever increasing expression. Again, the word expression of her yet unrealized potentialities, unrealized potentialities. So in nature, there is unrealized latent potentialities that is to be brought out and given expression and to unite herself with her own divine reality. So nature herself is moving towards that union, to unite herself with her own divine reality. What is that divine reality? Just keep that as a good placeholder to be understood. Right now we have it as a word, divine reality. So let me read it again. But all life, when we look behind the appearances, is a vast yoga of nature who attempts in the conscious and the subconscious 
to realize her perfection. In an ever-increasing expression, ever-increasing expression, there's a continuous movement from simple to more and more complex harmony. There's a process of rebirth and recreation, continuously moving towards a greater potentiality of her yet unrealized potentialities and to unite herself with her own divine reality. Here there is also the hint that the journey of evolution moving towards union with that divine reality. But it is unrealized, it is latent potentiality, it has to be brought out and given expression. That's what he is bringing in here. So it's not just our individual journey of yoga, our individual little practice, it's something vaster. It is nature's process, nature's yoga. In man, her thinker, very interesting phrase. Man, her thinker. We see ourselves as the thinkers who are actually independent of nature. That's one of our grand illusions. Here, from a yogic point of view, Sri Aurobindo is saying, in man, her thinker. We are her thinkers, nature's thinkers. Like our whole scientific revolution emerged from this whole power of thought, rational intelligence. I think, therefore I am, the famous line of Descartes. The power of thought, its ability to go beyond what appears to be sensory reality and to find the laws, truths behind appearances. Rational intelligence has tremendous capacity. And the whole science is built up on that. In man, her thinker, she, for the first time upon this earth, this earth, very important, very interesting phrase, because there are many earths. Sri has repeatedly clarified in all his writing, his concern is with earth, earth consciousness, this earth. Often, many yogic traditions are all talking about that which is beyond earth into the formless. Sri Aurobindo is very clear. This earth, in man, her thinker, she for the first time upon this earth, <clears throat> this earth, in man, her thinker, she for the first time upon this earth, devises self-conscious means and willed arrangements of activity. So in us, there is a self-reflective awareness. It's conscious. Our efforts can become conscious. So self-conscious means and willed arrangements. So when we decide to practice yoga, it's a willed arrangement for a definite purpose. It is a conscious action. In man, her thinker, she, for the first time upon this earth, devises self-conscious means and willed arrangements of activity by which this great purpose may be more swiftly and puissantly attained. So, nature's vast yoga is unfolding, has been unfolding over millions of years. And now on this earth, she has devised self-conscious means through her thinker in us, we the humans, in which nature has created the self-conscious means and willed arrangements of activity by which her great purpose of uniting with the divine reality can be accomplished, accomplished swiftly and puissantly. It can be accelerated and it can be more powerfully attained. So we have a role to play in nature's yoga. She has created us with that purpose to accelerate her own yoga. We are kind of engine of accelerating her yoga. We are instruments. Yoga, as Swami Vivekananda has said, Swami Vivekananda, the great son of India, who first time declared to the world in Chicago, the parliament of 
religions brought this whole vision to the world and swami vivekananda has played a very important role in sri aurobindo's yoga okay do you know that watch that film sri aurobindo a new dawn we have illustrated it beautifully watch that film it's available on youtube so coming back yoga as swami vivekananda has said may be regarded as a means of compressing one's evolution compressing one's evolution we know that our mobile phones our technologies are evolving rapidly and now artificial intelligence has emerged and it is evolving and accelerating the technological evolution and there is this whole fear that are we humans getting left behind and how do we evolve how do we upgrade ourselves how do we upgrade our mind how do we upgrade our heart how do we upgrade our body the hardware all that is a question and here swami vivekananda is saying yoga as swami vivekananda has said may be regarded as a means of compressing one's evolution so yoga is a means of compressing our evolution it is about evolving and evolution into a single life or a few years or even a few months of bodily existence in indian tradition it is accepted it is well known and default setting that there is rebirth and there is this whole process of rebirth through which we are evolving the soul is evolving it is part of indian common wisdom and yoga come in to accelerate that evolutionary journey evolution of consciousness and that acceleration that compression can be brought into a single lifetime or a few years or even a few months of bodily existence we know from sri aurobindo's own life when he met vishnu baskar lele lele within 3 days he could arrive at the experience of nirvana very exceptional ability that is possible so yoga may be regarded as a means of compressing one's evolution into a single life or a few years or even a few months of bodily existence so even if our technologies are evolving rapidly if we grasp the process of our own evolution we can in fact use everything to accelerate our individual evolution and yoga of nature herself through that that possibility yoga opens up but we must know what that process is a given system of yoga then can be no more than a selection or a compression a selection or a compression into narrower but more energetic forms of intensity of the general methods which are already being used so a given system of yoga in india you can see a large variety of systems of yoga each one having their own method often very contradictory and you might get confused by one saying this is the way and this is the right thing to do another saying it's not the way to do this is the way to do here he is saying a given system of yoga then can be no more than a selection or a compression into narrower but more energetic forms of intensity of the general methods which are already being used who is using it loosely largely in a leisurely movement with a profuse or apparent waste of material and energy but with a more complete combination by the great mother in her vast upward labor the great mother in her vast upward labor on earth we see an upward labor a seed sprouting is growing against gravity towards the sun you can say it's almost a symbolic representation of the potential awakening towards light and full radiance 
a flame ascending or within human nature there is an aspiration towards perfection something that want to ascend and with reference to human body there is up and down an ascension is with reference to human body and that movement arising from earth towards some greater perfection and there is a vast yoga of nature and labor of mother the divine mother and there are general methods already established but nature uses it loosely largely in a leisurely movement with a profuse apparent waste of material and energy that's how nature works if we look at a tree propagating itself it creates abundance of flowers and fruits and seeds out of that some seeds sprout and life continues the species propagate the same way in the human nature our own propagation if we look at male body produces millions of sperms and out of that one sperm goes and manages to fertilize the egg and the rest of the sperm die off it's like here what he is saying a profuse apparent waste of material and energy in nature's method there is this abundance of throwing out in a profusion and out of that there is the right click that happens and the propagation happens so a given system of yoga then can be no more than a selection or a compression into a narrower but more energetic forms of intensity of the general methods which are already being used nature is using general methods which has this apparent waste and she is going leisurely movement loosely and a given system of yoga is picking up some of these methods and making it focused like sunlight getting focused the rays of light is natural it's already there when you use a lens to focus it become narrower but more intense so it become intense that's what we do in the yogic processes we take nature's processes and intensify what is otherwise happening in a leisurely movement once the mother explained yoga to a child using a diagram where she drew a long winding spiral from a to b and then a straight line from a to b that is yoga the spiraling loosely lavishly generously moving movement is nature's yoga whatever we do we anyway will grow we will progress but that is slow and leisurely movement yoga is when it is conscious and straight the straight path not a crooked path and we can accelerate the journey instead of going through the winding pathways of nature a given system of yoga then can be no more than a selection or a compression into narrower but more energetic forms of intensity of the general methods which are already being used loosely largely in a leisurely movement with a profuse apparent waste of material and energy but with a more complete combination that's what we can do we can make these combinations much more focused intense by the great mother in her vast upward labor it is this view of yoga that alone that can alone form the basis for a sound and rational synthesis of yogic methods there are hundreds of yogic methods what is the foundation upon which we synthesize it what perspective what view we need to take here is the view sri aurobindo is giving it's already natures on yoga and we are picking up the established processes of nature making it more focused more intense that will help us to understand every yogic method that will give us a rational synthesis of yogic methods a ground for making rational synthesis not any arbitrary putting pieces together a rational synthesis for then yoga ceases to appear something mystic and abnormal 
which has no relation to the ordinary processes of the world energy or the purpose she keeps in view in her two great movements of subjective and objective self-fulfillment. So once we understand from this perspective, we can see that there is nothing mystical about it, nothing abnormal in it. And this whole world energy, it's not just the energy that is working through us, it's a world energy acting through all things, living, non-living, there is a thriving energy and there is vast yoga of nature unfolding and the purpose that she is keeping in this view of her two great movements of subjective and objective self-fulfillment. There is a subjective fulfillment. Nature has a subjective dimension and an objective dimension. We in humans, we have become conscious of the subjective dimension. So when an artist is creating a sculpture, a sculptor is creating a sculpture, he has this labor of love and eventually manifesting objectively, materially, the inner dream in a material form. That's an objective fulfillment. But at the same time, there is this joy of inner fulfillment. So vast yoga of nature is seeking both outer objective fulfillment as well as inner subjective fulfillment. She has that aim. This is very important to remember because Often yogic methods may focus only on inner subjective fulfillment. There is an outer objective fulfillment that is critically important. And Sri Aurobindo will come to that. For then yoga ceases to appear something mystic and abnormal, which has no relation to the ordinary processes of energy, world energy or the purpose she keeps in view in her two great movements of subjective and objective self-fulfillment. So when we look from that angle, we will see clearly. It reveals itself rather as an intense and exceptional use of powers she has already manifested, as we have touched upon it. It is already manifested powers. Or is progressively organizing. There are powers being organized. There are powers that are already manifest in nature. There are powers still being organized. For example, power of rational intelligence is already well developed and established in human beings. But the power of intuition it is still being organized. It is still emerging. Powers that she has already manifested or is progressively organizing in her less exalted but more general operations. Less, less exalted but more general operations. She is gradually, leisurely, with all this apparent waste, she is slowly organizing these latent potentials and bringing expression, bringing them outward form or manifest form and expression. A grand movement towards self-perfection. That is her movement that is unfolding. And we are part of that journey. And yoga, yogic processes, takes on this nature's processes and focus and intensify. So with that, we come to the second paragraph end. Now we are moving on to the third paragraph of the first chapter. Yogic methods have something of the same relation to the customary psychological workings of man. Customary psychological workings of man. There is our normal, customary psychological workings with our thoughts streaming through, our attention wandering from one thing to other, our emotions rising and falling, liking, dislike, attraction, repulsions. There is a whole range of customary, habitual, psychological workings. So yogic methods have something of the same relation to the customary psychological workings of man as has the scientific handling of the force of electricity and or of steam to their normal operations in nature. So on one hand, we have scientists who are looking at the material nature and her processes, studying deeply and understanding these processes 
and harnessing electricity, harnessing heat. Both heat and electricity, they are all already there in the normal operations of nature. Very atoms have electricity involved in it. When a lightning happens, it makes it itself visible, striking way. Heat is already involved in everything. And we can tap into that. And that's how we are building our technologies. So taking what is operating in nature in its normal conditions, and science has a relationship to that, a scientific approach to it. And it is exactly the same Yoga has a relationship with psychological processes, psychological forces. And the relationship is more or less the same. Psych yoga uses psychological processes. Science uses material processes and their forces. One is outward and objective. Yoga is subjective. It is in our inner psychological space, we work. Whereas in scientific exploration, we work on the external objective material nature. So yogic methods have something of the same relation to the customary psychological workings of man, as has the scientific handling of force of electricity or of steam to their normal operations in nature. And they too, like the operations of science, are formed upon a knowledge developed and confirmed by regular experiment, practical analysis, and constant result. So the whole yogic approach is something very similar to scientific approach to material objective nature. There is a body of knowledge developed and confirmed by regular experiment, regular psychological experiment. A yogic method that utilizes psychological forces when there is a method given, say this, if you do this, if you follow this protocol, you get this result. Now you need to follow the protocol and practice it and experiment and analyze the result and arrive at a constant result. Then only it can be a confirmed yogic body of knowledge. It's not philosophy. Yoga is not philosophy. Yoga is really this practical handling of the subjective forces and very systematic for that matter. And they too, like the operations of science, are formed upon a knowledge developed and confirmed by regular experiment, practical analysis, and constant result. All Raja Yoga, Raja Yoga is one of the ancient paths of yoga. All Raja Yoga, for instance, it depends on this perception and experience, this perception and experience, not only perception, but also there is a validation through experience, that our inner elements, combinations, functions, forces can be separated or dissolved. Let's unpack this. Our inner elements, say thought, memory, attention, the willpower, emotion, these are all inner elements. Combinations, say a sensation and memory and emotion, a thought, they are all work in relationship and they can be combined. Functions, forces, so emotions have certain function, thought has certain function, memory has certain function, and all of them have corresponding forces. So here are the key four words, the uh, 
four keywords he has given elements, combinations, functions, forces can be separated or dissolved. Say the operation of thought when it is mixed with emotions is one thing, but you can separate emotion and pure rational intelligence. That's perfectly possible. possible. So a scientific training requires that. You need to be freeing your pure intelligence from its attachments, attractions, preferences, emotional, personal biases, all that, so that the intelligence is free. So they can be separated or even dissolved. An inner psychological movement which can be dissolved, a certain habitual patterns can be dissolved, a thought pattern can be dissolved, a movement of thought, even the entire operations of thinking can be brought to deep silence. All that are possible. Can be new combined and set to novel and formerly impossible workings. So we can take up different inner elements. We can take up our attention and our will and power of imagination. They can be combined in a very potent way. Can be new combined and set to novel and formerly impossible workings. So when we combine and utilize them, they will yield results that are otherwise impossible or can be transformed and resolved into a new general synthesis by fixed internal processes. Now, this is a perception and experience of Raja Yoga. In Raja Yoga, for example, this whole movement or whole capacity of Pratyahara, where you withdraw all the senses from outward going movements, gather it inward, from Pratyahara, you move on to Dharana. And Dharana is where you hold such a gathered, concentrated attention upon your object of concentration. And as you dwell deeper and deeper on the object of concentration, it becomes Dhyana, where you are continuously dwelling on that object of concentration. From Dhyana, you deepen into Samadhi, where subject object differentiation ends and there is a merging of subject and object and a knowing from that state of being. That capacity is not normal. It is built over systematic training over years. Like a scientific lab is built systematically with detailed attention. In this case, it is your inner space that is the lab where you pick up specific capacities, powers of the mind, combine them and put them into a use that is otherwise impossible and re yielding results that are way beyond our normal operations. And these are done by fixed internal processes. There are certain internal processes to be done, which are also fixed internal processes. There is a systematic way of doing which yields certain specific results. So all Raja Yoga, for instance, depends on this perception and experience that our inner elements, combinations, functions, forces can be separated or dissolved can be new combined and set to novel and formerly impossible workings, or can be transformed and resolved into a new general synthesis by fixed internal processes. The new general synthesis, transformation and new general synthesis is this kind of capacities that are developed over years of training, where elements are picked up, gathered, focused and transformed into a new synthesis so that there is a new faculty, new capacity and this is done by fixed internal processes. That's what Raja Yoga does and it uses the mind and its powers. 
Hatha Yoga similarly depends on this perception and experience. He is repeating that phrase. Hatha Yoga similarly depends on this perception and experience that the vital forces and functions to which our life is normally subjected and whose ordinary operations seem set and indispensable. By the way, Hatha Yoga is again a traditional path, a path in which the asanas, the postures and related kriyas and processes are the central methods used and it is dependent on the perception and experience that the vital forces, vital forces are the ones that gives us the vitality, that animates us, the prana shakti, the pranic force. These vital forces and functions to which our life is normally subjected. There is a normal operations of these vital forces and functions and whose ordinary operations seem set and indispensable like our breathing, our heartbeat, all these are indispensable to the normal life. There is no, you can, there is no way you can stop it. It is indispensable. They are set. There is a certain rhythm with which it is unfolding. Can be mastered and the operations changed or suspended. And that's what Hatha Yogins do they master their breath even to the point where you can bring breath to a complete stillness or your heartbeat control the heartbeat bring into a deep stillness entire body into an absolute stillness entire movement of prana in the body to an absolute contained concentrated stillness that's the possibility that the yogins utilize So they can even suspend the heartbeat, suspend the breath with results that would otherwise be impossible and that seem miraculous to those who have not seized the rationale of their process. If you don't know the methods they are using, it might look very miraculous. But there is nothing miraculous. There is a systematic process behind it and it is a result of training just like building a lab that can perform certain functions. So Hadayogins use the vital forces, master them and create this new way of dealing with them, mastering them and directing them. So he has covered now Raja Yoga, Hatha Yoga. Let's move on. And if in some other of its forms, this character of yoga is less apparent. Now he's looking at other paths where such a systematic method is less apparent because they are not, they are more intuitive and less mechanical. So there are methods that are more intuitive and less mechanical. Say, Hatha Yogic methods of asanas, those postures and breathing techniques, Kriya, they are practically very mechanical methods. Here he is suggesting, he is saying, because they, the other methods, intuitive and less mechanical, nearer, like the yoga of devotion to a supernal ecstasy, like the yoga of knowledge to a supernal infinity of consciousness and being. And yet, they too start from the use of some principal faculty in us by ways and, to, and for ends not contemplated in its everyday spontaneous workings. Take for example, the yoga of devotion, bhakti yoga, which utilizes this faculty of heart and its emotions. In its normal operations, it is anyway working, it is building relationships, affection, connection, bonding, with all its attractions, repulsions, with liking, disliking, all that. That's a normal operation. 
the same faculties utilized, purified, intensified, and brought to a supernal ecstasy. That's the path which is not mechanical at all. It is more intuitive. The relationship with the divine as the beloved, the divine reality as that profound love and relationship, intensity of that intimacy with the divine, all that are part of the yoga of devotion. And we don't see anything mechanical there. It is intuitive, yet it uses a faculty of already developed processes of nature, which is our heart and our emotions. Same way, yoga of knowledge utilizes the power of discerning intellect, where in Vedanta we can see the whole approach of neti neti, this body is not mine, these thoughts are not mine, these emotions are not mine, no, that's not me. I am not this body, not this thought, not this emotion, not this sensation. And stripping off layer by layer, going into the empty, formless source. To a supernal infinity of consciousness and being. Infinity of consciousness and being, where you are dissociating, disconnecting and freeing yourself up from the all manifest processes and forms and enter into that supernal infinity of consciousness and being. So let me read this full line once again. And if in some other of its forms, this character of yoga is less apparent because they are more intuitive and less mechanical, nearer like the yoga of devotion to supernal ecstasy or like the yoga of knowledge to a supernal infinity of consciousness and being. Yet they too start from the use of some principal faculty in us by ways and to, for ends not contemplated in its everyday spontaneous workings. All methods grouped under the common name of yoga, whatsoever be the method, whether it is Hatha Yoga, Raja Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Jnana Yoga, whatsoever it is. All methods grouped under the common name Yoga are special psychological processes. Special psychological processes founded on a fixed truth of nature. So it's not something arbitrary and it is based on certain fixed truth of nature and developing out of normal functions, powers and results which were always latent. So there is a normal function of our psychological processes, but there are latent powers. We develop those latent powers out of normal functions but which her ordinary movements do not easily or do not often manifest. So all methods grouped under the common name of yoga are special psychological processes founded on a fixed truth of nature and developing out of normal functions, powers and results which were always latent, but which her ordinary movements do not easily or do not often manifest. If we look at Nikola Tesla or Ramanujam, the mathematician, we can see that they had a faculty of consciousness that was way beyond the average human being, an exceptional capacity, a genius. But they did not develop it through yogic process. This is nature's early prototypes, let's say the faculty of intuition, that which is beyond rational intelligence. But such examples are rare. Masses do not have that capacity. These are rare examples where nature reveals a possibility. So 
So powers and results which were always latent, latent powers gets revealed in some exceptional individuals, but which her ordinary movements do not easily or do not often manifest. So that's the uh, end of the third paragraph. And with it, we are coming to a closure of today's episode. So we covered two paragraphs. First one about yoga, what yoga is, the big picture about yoga, where it is not our individual effort and journey. There is a yoga of nature, which is moving consciously or subconsciously. And we are her thinkers, agents, through which she can actually accelerate the evolution, her own ascending movement towards higher and higher possibilities to unite with her divine reality. And he touches upon the yogic methods as actually utilization of the processes that are already operational in nature. And various schools pick up different aspects of these psychological processes and intensify and produce results that are way beyond the normal operations. And this way, the yogins work is something very similar to the way scientists work with electricity or steam. So that's the picture that we get from these two paragraphs. And yoga is nothing mystical, nothing abnormal. It is science of consciousness from a yogic approach and perspective. So looking forward to see you for the next episode. And as usual, I would love to get your feedback, your suggestions for improvement. And let me know your insights, your inspiration, whatsoever helped you from this episode. Please share them. And also make sure you subscribe so that you can keep in touch with this series. Thank you.